Hello and welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new here. My name is Kaylee and I teach yoga and fitness here on YouTube as well as on my app called The Glow Method. It has been so long since I filmed this type of video and we need to catch up. I traveled for about a month and just got back recently. You probably already know, but I was in Mexico leading a yoga and Pilates retreat. And then my boyfriend Noah and I took about three weeks to travel in Mexico and spend time in Mexico City with some of our friends that we haven't seen in a while. Every part of the trip was amazing. It was so nice to get out of the US for a little bit and leading the retreat was honestly the best ever. It was so fun and I can't wait to do it again soon. I gave you all the opportunity to ask me any questions that you would like to know and this leads me to my first one, which is when is the next retreat? I am planning them all on my own this time, different from how I did it last time, so I'm kind of learning as I go and figuring everything out. There is a lot to plan but I am hoping to eventually get to doing two to four retreats a year, depending on where they are and what season and that sort of thing. The most requested place is Central America, specifically Costa Rica or Nicaragua, Guatemala, and I have leads on venues there, so I just have to get everything worked out. But hopefully in winter 2024, we will be all set to go down there and experience the jungle and the beach and the beauty of Central America together. So if you are interested in coming and you want to fill out the Google form survey that I have and give suggestions on where we should go, what we should do, that type of thing, I will leave the link down below and I seriously cannot wait to meet you. A lot of you asked similar questions, so I'm going to sort of break it down into categories. Right now, I'm just answering sort of the miscellaneous questions. So the next one is, are you planning on doing a vlog sometime soon? It makes me so happy to get this question because I feel like my vlogs don't get a lot of views and people don't like them as much as they like my classes, but I've been getting a lot of messages recently asking about posting more vlogs and that is definitely something that I wanna work on. It's so fun for me to create them because it's a different type of creativity for me and yes, they are coming soon. I am working on scheduling out a couple and yeah, I'm super excited for them. The next question is, what are your favorite workout clothes? And so mostly I wear aloe, as you probably know, that is one of my all time favorites. It has been for, I don't know, almost 10 years now, honestly. So I love them. They are a little bit pricey, but if you're a teacher, you can actually get a 30% discount by signing up for their pro program. Um, it's just on their website. It's pretty easy to figure it out. As long as you are teaching currently, you can get 30% off. So that's really helpful in being able to buy clothes because it is really expensive. Set Active is another one that's a little bit more affordable and honestly, similar quality. They have a bunch of different types of fabric, so you can kind of find whatever you're looking for. And I'm not really a Lululemon girly. Again, that's really expensive and I just never really got into it. I feel like I gravitate towards the more stylish activewear, if that makes sense. Lululemon is sort of basic for me. Um, I do have one pair of the Align leggings though, and they are so comfortable. I do love to wear them. Other than that, I have a couple Free People Movement, and I have been trying out a couple other brands, but I really haven't found anything that I really love. So if you have suggestions as well, I would love to hear them. Next question is, how are you doing? Are you still planning to move to Spain? We were never planning to move to Spain specifically. We were going to move to Portugal. Um, basically, my boyfriend, he has EU citizenship because he's Finnish. So we've always wanted to live in Europe. I've always wanted to live in Europe. He has lived there and he likes it better there than he does in the US. Um, we just haven't moved because of some family stuff and we don't want to go too far away just because of everything that's going on. I also need to get a visa, which isn't the easiest process. 
and I started looking into the D7 visa in Portugal, which I talked a little bit about on Instagram. But basically, over the past couple of months, I have learned through the internet that it's not beneficial for Portuguese people for a lot of expats to move there and work remotely. Um, I would be contributing to the economy in terms of, you know, food and housing and that type of thing, um, but the visa prohibits me from working there. I just have to do more research about it because I don't want to negatively impact the country that I moved to and I just want to be really respectful. So I know a couple of other countries are rolling out a similar type of visa like Croatia and Italy. Um, and we could move to Finland because I could get a visa through NOAA, but I don't love the cold and it's really dark there in the winter, but we still might move there and then go somewhere else for the winter months and travel and do that type of thing. So we'll see. Eventually I will come to Europe though and I would love to travel around and do retreats of course and pop-up classes in different cities. So that is definitely something that is going to happen in the next couple of years. So the first sort of category of questions is my workout routine. I got a lot of these questions and also my yoga journey. So we'll just go through those. What inspired you to practice yoga initially? I was in high school and one of my best friend's mom went to yoga all the time. One time I was over her house, she asked if we wanted to go and on a whim we said yes. I had no idea what to expect and it was the most transformative experience of my life. I think I was in between freshman and sophomore year, so I was probably 15 about to turn 16. So yeah, I had never experienced anything like that before. I was immediately hooked. I absolutely loved it. I didn't go a ton in the studio in high school just because it was kind of far from my house. I didn't have a car or a license yet. And I also didn't go because it's expensive for a 15 year old who doesn't have a solid job. All I did was nanny or babysit. But I did practice at home. My mom actually had a couple of Jillian Michaels DVDs, which is so funny to me now. Now. and so I would practice consistently at home. I would also do some of her Pilates DVDs. This is really dating me. I am so millennial. <laughs> and I played sports in high school, specifically lacrosse was my thing. And the improvement that I saw the next season after practicing yoga and Pilates was night and day. I improved so much. And so that was a motivator for me. Also, trigger warning for anyone who has an eating disorder. I'll be talking about this throughout class because I did get a couple of questions about it. I had an eating disorder in middle school. So from 11 to 14-ish, it was really bad. I was in the hospital all the time and I was so not healthy. I started getting healthier in the beginning of high school, which thank God, but yoga really just helped me reconnect to my body and create that self-love. And it was a way to move my body that I actually really loved. So that also helped a lot. And it was kind of one of those things where I honestly just knew that it was going to be a part of my life from the first time that I did it. Next question is, do you incorporate some sort of body movement into your day every day? I'd say yes because we just live an all-around active lifestyle. We love to go hiking when we can, so sometimes we'll go for an evening hike. We always go for some sort of walk, whether it's just walking to the store if we need something for dinner or just to walk around and get outside. Honestly, I do it more for my mental health than my physical health even. Since Noah and I both work from home, it is really easy to just stay inside literally all day long if we don't make ourselves go outside and go on a walk. So it just brightens up our day in that way and makes us feel so much better. There are definitely days that I don't do a workout though and I just go on a walk. Next question is, what fitness equipment do you use at home? I use all of the things that I use with you guys in my videos. So weights, mini ball, resistance bands. I recently just got longer resistance bands because you all have been requesting classes with those. So I got a couple of those, a set of three, 
and I also just got the Magic Circle Pilates ring. I don't have any super heavy weights or kettlebells or that type of thing. I use those things when I go to the gym. Next question is, could you share your weekly workout schedule? And I got this question a couple of times and I am filming a whole week of workouts for my next video, so you will see it there. But as you know, I do a wide range of workouts and I feel like that's what works best for my body. It might not work best for everybody, but I love the diversity in terms of not getting bored. And also I have found the most strength in my body comes from doing a bunch of different types of movements so that I never really plateau, if that makes sense. How do you balance exercise for yourself, for work and filming, strength training? Do you have rough guidelines or a typical week? This is one of the hardest things about being an instructor for sure. I am sure other instructors feel this. It is honestly so hard to balance filming and working out for myself, but since my main source of income is from my app, I always prioritize filming over my own workouts, which isn't always ideal, but you know, I'm doing basically the same workouts as you all and they are very well-rounded and good enough for what I need. I do really love having those days where I'm not working and I just get to work out for myself. But yeah, filming always comes before my own workouts. And generally I will try to batch film. So I'll plan a bunch of classes and say I'm teaching half workout classes, half yoga classes for the month. I will pair workout classes with some yoga classes. So I'm doing sort of a well-rounded workout throughout the day and I'm not just overusing and over-exercising the same muscles all day long. So if I'm filming a yoga sculpt, a Pilates class, and a vinyasa flow, I'll pair those together rather than filming, you know, all of the yoga classes in one day and then all of the workout classes in another day. Also, thank you for all of the kind words that you all sent with the questions. I'm not going to read them out loud, but you all mean the absolute world to me. The next is, do you do yoga and stretch every morning to stay flexible? Any tips on how to keep it up for someone who doesn't have much time in the mornings? I say consistency is key with flexibility. I know that when I don't prioritize a yoga practice and it kind of ebbs and flows for me, sometimes I like working out more than I like practicing yoga and vice versa, but the reason that I became flexible was because I was super consistent when I first started practicing. So way back, you know, 12, 10 years ago, I would practice every single day. I would usually do a 90 minute home practice. And I also went to Ashtanga and hot yoga. So that helped a lot as well. But consistency is definitely key. You don't need to do a 90 minute practice every day. I was just obsessed with yoga and that's why. And I had a really great mentor that I would practice with also. 10, 15, 20 minutes in the morning and stretching sort of every major group so hamstrings, quads, your shoulders, your thoracic spine, that type of thing, I definitely recommend if flexibility is your goal. What is your workout split? That is coming in my next video and it's going to be very thorough and I'll show you all the exercises I do, so please be patient for that. Next question is, do you go to the gym? Again, it's coming. Um, again, another exercise routine question. And the last one for this category is what other virtual classes or instructors do you do? I don't do many, honestly. I have an Alamove subscription just because I've had one forever. I definitely don't utilize it as much as I should or as I want to just because it is hard to get in a home workout. And if I do have time to do a different type of workout, I will probably go to a hot yoga class in studio or go to the gym, that type of thing, just to get out of the house. But sometimes I do bar or Pilates classes on Allo Moves. I like Emily. And I also like Bianca's classes sometimes. I honestly don't love any of the yoga instructors on Allo, um, besides Kayla Nielsen, who really doesn't teach there um, anymore. So I don't really do yoga or anything at home 
with someone else. I'll do my own personal practice. I also like Move with Nicole on YouTube. Her Pilates classes are very classical and chill, but also a challenging workout. The next category is food, eating, body image type of thing. So the first question is, what is your favorite food? Honestly, I love all food. I am not a picky eater at all. And at least now I'm not restrictive or anything like that. We pretty much always cook when we are at home just because Noah and I both love to. And we both love to go to the farmer's market and get fresh vegetables and that type of thing. So foods that we cook are Mediterranean, like a chicken with tzatziki and potatoes, or sometimes we'll make Turkish rice with it. Um, like a Mediterranean type of salad with cucumber and tomato and lots of herbs, that type of thing. Absolutely, I could eat that most nights and be satisfied. I also really like cooking Asian food, so anything that has tofu or salmon, rice bowls, that type of thing is one of my absolute favorites. Noah has been making sourdough bread recently and that is the best, honestly. I didn't eat gluten for a long time, like almost 10 years, and it feels so good to eat it again. It honestly tastes amazing. And then if we go out to eat, I love like tapas type of places where you can just share a bunch of plates with your friends or whoever you're at dinner with. I also love french fries. If I go out, especially like a truffle fry, always gonna get fries if they're on the menu. We do like sushi and that type of thing sometimes as well. So yeah, I pretty much like all food. The only types of food I really don't like are anything that's super heavy and fried. So heavy in the way that it has a lot of cream or it's just like a lot of Southern food, honestly, which is funny because we live in a Southern city right now. It's just not my thing. I didn't grow up eating it. So I would always go for the fresher option versus a heavier option. The next question is simple tips to eat more whole foods if you're not used to cooking for yourself. Honestly, I think for this one is just to buy produce. So if you don't buy a lot of pre-packaged things at the grocery store, you literally have no other choice but to cook. And also if you're not used to cooking for yourself, I would make a list of meals that you would like to cook during the week and go grocery shopping based off of that. So you have all the ingredients, you don't need to go you know, every day to get something that you need and just have sort of a rough guideline. I personally don't love to plan out our week or meal prep or that type of thing just because I eat intuitively based on the day, how hungry I am, what I feel like eating. But I know that some people do find it really helpful to meal prep. So if you have really busy days, you could cook a bunch of vegetables like sweet potatoes and beets or root vegetables and keep those in the fridge. You know, you could cook some quinoa or rice. You can have arugula or greens and then sort of throw it all together in a bowl. I probably eat some type of bowl like that every single day because it literally is so easy to make. And also stick with more simple recipes at first. You can do a stir fry or a salad. Those are both really easy to make. Don't give yourself really complicated big meals to cook at first and then as you get comfortable cooking you will just gradually get more advanced in what you are making next question is what are your best pre-workout meals to fuel you what kind of food do you snack on so i used to be the type of person who didn't like to eat breakfast but i felt it in my energy levels throughout the day so much and so now I always eat breakfast even if I am planning on filming or doing a workout in the morning. And some things that I really like to have are simple. So oatmeal with some fruit and almond butter, that is a really great one because it doesn't fill you up too much, but it does give you energy to get through the workout. I also love doing simple eggs with greens and potatoes or a little piece of sourdough bread, something like that. I definitely don't like to eat a lot before a workout, and I usually give myself two hours to digest the food before I start moving, 
But yeah, I think simple with a lot of nutrients. So whole foods for sure. You could also do a piece of toast with avocado or a piece of toast with almond butter and banana, that type of thing. And I honestly don't snack a lot. I'd say I pretty much just have three meals in the day and that's it. And because I'm prioritizing the nutrients and the macros in my food, like I'll always have a protein, a fat, and a carb, I don't get super hungry in between. If I do, I'll make a smoothie or something like that, maybe a piece of fruit, um, a piece of toast, but when you really balance your meals, you don't end up getting hungry as much. The next question is, what prompted your decision to start eating gluten and dairy again? Is your diet restricted in any way? No, it is not currently restricted at all for the first time in a long time, since I was 16 when I became vegetarian for the first time. I think the reason why I started eating gluten and dairy again was because I was honestly just sick of being the one who didn't eat something when we were out with friends or family and it really just doesn't feel good to be that person that can't eat what everyone else is eating and not enjoy the meal with everybody else. So that was my driving force behind it. Um, I restricted for so long because I had an eating disorder, like I said, and I think that when I became vegetarian halfway through high school, that's sort of when my eating disorder transitioned from anorexia to orthorexia. So instead of not eating, I ate, but I was obsessed with only eating healthy things. And so I became vegetarian and then quickly became vegan and then right after that became gluten free. And so I restricted my diet in many ways for many years. And I, yeah, I was just honestly sick of it. I hated being the person to say, you know, I can't have that or enjoy things with friends. And I was always really scared that I would get sick because I hadn't eaten gluten or dairy in so long. And honestly, it was all in my head because I didn't. I would literally get more stomach aches when I didn't eat gluten or dairy than I do now. I have no restrictions and I have no stress when I'm eating. And now I really just never get stomach aches. So it's a really interesting thing how connected the mind and the gut is. And so, for me, it was just a really freeing thing to do, and then it ended up positively impacting how I feel in general all the time. The next question is, I'd love to know about your relationship with body weight, body image, and food. So I touched on this just a little bit in that last question, but I definitely go back and forth, and I think that in the past couple of years, I've really just leaned into nourishing my body rather than caring about what it looks like all the time. And it's really hard to explain. It's a really nuanced situation and you know, it's different for literally every single person. The next question is, I'd love to know about your relationship with body weight, body image, and food. This is a hard and very nuanced question, but I think the biggest shift that came for me. I mean, I've had a couple. So in the early days of my eating disorder, I was counting calories and very influenced by media, specifically magazines and that type of thing. And so I was obsessed with not eating so that I would lose weight. And I honestly don't even remember ever knowing that I had an eating disorder. And until my parents were like, you are sick and you're going to the hospital right now. Um, I think that I was so programmed because of the way that the world is and how we are obsessed with losing weight. I just thought it was completely normal and I was getting that gratification of so many compliments right when I first started losing weight. So in the beginning, it definitely was like that for me. But like I said, I eventually shifted from anorexia to orthorexia. And then I basically obsessed about the health benefits of food versus how it was going to make me look. But it was still an eating disorder because I was being so controlling and restrictive. And so I think that honestly, I've 
most recently gotten out of it when I started eating gluten again, maybe a year or a year and a half ago. I just totally detached my body from the food that I was eating. And now I look at eating as a source of nutrition, yes, but that I don't give each different food a specific power, if that makes sense. So when I eat a salad versus if I eat a burger, they're the same to me in my mind because they're nourishing in different ways. One of them, it maybe is more nourishing for the soul. It's more enjoyable. I mean, I do love salads so much, genuinely. So both of them make me feel good. But I've just learned to detach the physical effects it has on my body and focus just on the enjoyment, the experience of eating food, knowing that eating one meal is not going to change my weight and that as long as I have my consistent routines that make me feel generally good, like working out, going on walks, that type of thing. And, and it just takes away that stress of eating. It's really hard, it's really nuanced, and it took a lot of time, many, many years to get to this place. But I think just being grateful to even have food because it is something that we need to live and thinking about the bigger picture if you have starved yourself for so long it is affecting your internal organs negatively it's affecting your brain it's affecting your skin your hair everything like that so i think just taking a step back and acknowledging that food is a gift and we are lucky to have it and that we literally need it to survive and thrive is what really changed it for me. And also acknowledging that your weight's gonna fluctuate throughout your entire life all the time. I went through a phase last summer where we were traveling a lot, we had to go home because of family emergency. I wasn't able to work out or have my routine and I went through kind of a depressive phase because of that. And I definitely noticed that I felt like I was gaining a little bit more weight. And as someone who has had an eating disorder, you have to just be diligent and mindful of those times and know that it's not forever. Everything, you know, is temporary and you're always changing, shifting. And I hope that answered your question. It's a really hard one. The next question is also advice for eating disorder. So I feel like I just answered that. The next question is, have you ever struggled with orthorexia? If so, how do you balance healthy eating and exercise without getting too anxious, stressed? I feel like I also just covered that. The next question is, have you ever suffered loss of period while training? I honestly haven't. I was late to get my period because I was so undernourished in middle school, so I didn't get my period until I was 15, um, which my, like, my little sister got it years before I did, so, and my mom got it you know, in fifth grade, so I was definitely late in terms of my family genetics to get it, but I've never lost it again after that, like I said, because I transitioned from an eating disorder into orthorexia, so I ate, but I was just obsessed with only eating healthy. And I honestly probably didn't overtrain until I started filming. And I went through a phase in 2021 where I was definitely over exercising and not eating enough. And that probably has to do with also teaching classes in studio and driving around and simply just not having a lot of time to eat. I was never restricting myself in that way, but because I was trying to build my business, I was constantly filming classes and also filming really hard classes, and I ended up getting injured because I trained too much and didn't let my body rest, and I was always sore. I feel like I never saw progress. I was definitely the skinniest that I have been in a really long time. But I remember feeling so bad all the time. I was always tired. I always had brain fog. I would get headaches often and I would literally fall asleep at 8 p.m. every single night, which is crazy to me because that is so early. And 
yes, I would wake up early to go teach classes in person sometimes, but that's just not normal. Like I felt so bad all the time and it's because I was over exercising and not nourishing myself in the way that I should have been. Um, but I never lost my period, so I don't have advice on that. But I would just say, eat more. Because I have seen such a difference from then to now. When I eat breakfast, I have three well-balanced, nourishing meals throughout the day. I feel a million times better. I can't even explain it. I never have brain fog anymore. I sleep well. I wake up feeling rested. So I think really the key is to just getting over that hump of thinking you need to, you know, eat a certain number of calories a day to stay the same weight that you are. Or maybe coming to terms with the fact that you having abs may not be right for your body, which I honestly don't naturally have defined abs. I tend to hold some of my weight in my stomach and it's hard, especially being on camera and always seeing myself, but I have noticed that since I've transitioned from my under eating, over exercising into a normal workout schedule and normal eating schedule, I don't have abs really anymore. Maybe sometimes when I'm in my follicular or ovulatory phase, but honestly, I just don't think it's a natural thing for my body to have. and. Yeah, I've just come to terms with that. And, you know, abs don't make you a better person. They don't make you more lovable or, you know, sometimes we just need to come to terms with the reality of life and the fact that it usually is not an indicator of health if women have abs. It's oftentimes the indicator of under eating, over exercising and that type of thing. The next question is on the same page, do you always feel good about your body? And no, I just touched on that a little bit. I have bad days and good days as well. And I think again, as women, we just have to know that some days are gonna feel really bad, really yucky, and some days will feel good. And you just have to go with the flow know that things don't last forever, that change is always happening, feelings are temporary. And again, just take a step back and remember that the way that you look literally doesn't matter. It doesn't make you more lovable. And even though that society tells us that, that is just programming for us to buy things to make us feel better. And it's all wrapped up in capitalism. So yeah, taking a step back, knowing that as long as you feel good and healthy in your body, you're doing something right and that is literally all that matters. So prioritizing feeling over the aesthetic, which I talk about sometimes in class as well, I think will help you the most. The next question is, I've been practicing yoga and Pilates for almost three years. Despite regular practice, I cannot seem to be able to do more advanced workouts. Any tips on how to progress? from intermediate to more advanced. So this is kind of a hard question because I don't know you and I don't see your practice in real life. And so I can't give very specific advice, but I think honestly, just knowing that it takes time and also knowing that your body isn't going to look the same as mine in a pose or anyone else in a studio class. and we literally have different bone structure and anatomy. So like for me, I don't know if I'll ever be able to do a middle split. It just literally doesn't happen for my body. My body doesn't open that way. So I've just sort of come to terms with the fact that I don't think that that's ever gonna be a reality for me. And that's totally okay. I don't need to do a middle splits to be a good yoga teacher or be an advanced yogi. So. I think that's the first step is to being real with yourself. The only advice that I can give is consistency. And I know that you said you've been consistent for a couple of years, but knowing that you're consistent will have different results than someone else's. One other thing for me was I saw a huge improvement in my general balance and stability and the ability to do more advanced poses, especially inversions and arm balances when I started cross training. 
So for the first part of my yoga journey, I literally just practiced yoga. Sometimes I would do body weight Pilates stuff, like I said, but mostly it was yoga. And so I was really focusing on the flexibility aspect without cross training. And so I could do everything, but not to the ability that I can do it now. So I was able to hold a crow pose, but it wasn't as strong and stable as I can now because I never worked out my shoulders or my upper body. So if you aren't cross training with weights, I would suggest doing that as well because that will build your muscles in a different way than yoga will and it will help to support your practice. I would also suggest getting a private, a one-on-one -on -one, or going to an in-studio class if you are looking for feedback on your practice and getting into some poses because if someone can see you in the flesh, they're more likely to be able to give you the exact advice that you need to get to the next level. And I would love to do that for you if you came on a retreat. The next question is, are any of your YouTube classes suitable for beginners? Yes, the chill vinyasa or slow flow classes, definitely. I do have some beginner friendly power vinyasa classes, but I wouldn't say those are beginner classes, if that makes sense. They are beginner friendly in the way that they are the same level as a studio that you would go to in person which is an all levels class power vinyasa. So still challenging for those who want a more advanced practice, but I give modifications. So none of them are 100% made for beginners, just because I feel like those types of classes, when I do post them, even just the beginner friendly ones, they don't do as well and people don't ask for them as much as they ask for the more advanced, but if you would really like some pure beginner classes, I would love to create some. The next question is, how do you reach and master your crow? The next question is, how do you reach and master your crow pose? And that is very hard for me to answer without seeing you and seeing your practice, like I said before. But I think with any arm balance or advanced pose like that, it is simply trying it doing it consistently again and again and again until you can get into it. And like I touched on before, cross training so that you build strength in different parts of the body than you would in yoga so that you can get into it easier. But really it's just practicing, trying it again and again. And I don't have any specific tutorials on Crow. I could make them if you would like but using props so you can put a block on the highest setting in front of you and sort of rest your head on it as you start to lift your feet. Again, you can also put a block I would do on the lowest setting underneath your feet so that you're a little bit higher up and then try to lift from there. You could put pillows in front of your face so that if you do fall forward, you fall into a pillow rather than the floor. And a lot of times with advanced poses, it is much more in your mind than it is in your body. So if you are super scared of falling forward, you're gonna fall forward in the pose when you try it. So sort of detaching those emotions and feelings from the pose as you practice and try to do it and know that it takes time. It took me a long time. The first time I did a crow pose, I fell on my face and gave myself a bloody lip. So we literally all start somewhere and I just was determined to get it. And so I would practice over and over and over. And eventually one day I got it and then I was able to progress from there. The next question is about prenatal Pilates, which I am not specifically prenatal trained. So I don't feel comfortable giving advice on this topic. I am doing a training soon to get more knowledge in the prenatal space, but all of the contraindications that I know from my trainings are no twisting, no laying on the belly, um, no crunching ab work. So you can do dead bugs and that type of thing, but modifying all of those ab based workouts, pretty much everything else you can do as long as it's not super deep twists. You could do planks, you could do side planks, all of the tabletop stuff. But like I said, I'm not specifically prenatal trained, so I would definitely seek out someone to help you through that journey. And also congratulations on 
that journey and I'm wishing the best for you. The last category, which there are quite a few questions, is teaching tips and about my teaching journey. So the first one is, do you see yourself teaching long term? How do you see your career evolving over the next decade and beyond? This is something that I haven't thought about too much. Um, yes, I do see myself teaching long term. I feel like this is just my thing. I have always felt like that since I began teaching. And also my mentor in my very early days of yoga, she was actually the one who pushed me to become a teacher. She was literally in her 70s when I met her and we would do 90 minute Ashtanga practices together every day. You know, she was doing handstands, drop backs, that type of thing. So she was really a model for me in seeing that you can literally practice yoga for your entire life because it's so good for you. It's so good for your joints. And so I do see myself teaching long term. I definitely have other passions as well, which I've talked about before. I love clothes. I love fashion. I would love to own an activewear lounge brand eventually. And I don't have any concrete plans on doing that anytime soon, but that's definitely in the back of my mind. I also really love vintage and I have always seen myself having a vintage store at some point in my life and I'm also super passionate about food and coffee and another dream of mine is to own a cafe with an attached yoga studio so have like super healthy local food and juices and that type of thing at the cafe so there are other things that I'd like to do, but I do see yoga always being sort of my main focus because it is how I feel like I bring the most value to the world. The next question is, where did you do your teacher training and what other qualifications do you have? I did my 200 hour in Spain with Frog Lotus Yoga. It was actually a weird serendipitous thing because I signed up for this training I was super young, I was 20, so I really didn't know what I was doing. And I didn't really know anything about it besides the fact that it was Yoga Alliance certified and that it was a reputable program. And just by chance, after I signed up for it, I learned that they have a studio, like a sister studio in Massachusetts, literally close to where I grew up. And so that was a weird serendipitous thing. And then when I got there, in my early 20s, I was obsessed with sunflowers. They were my favorite flower. And I like even my Instagram handle was Grateful Sunflower because I also used to be a super deadhead when I was younger. And on the way to the training, I literally was driving through fields and fields and fields of sunflowers. And I got to the retreat center and it was literally just surrounded by fields of sunflowers. So. It was definitely very serendipitous. I met a bunch of amazing friends there and yeah, just a magical time. I do really love that training for what it was. It was a month long immersion type of thing and I definitely learned a lot. I would say that I also learned an equal amount, if not more from my mentor because I just had one-on-one -on -one classes and practices with her often. And she trained with Iyengar and Batabi Joyce in India back in the 70s. So she was a wealth of knowledge. She took me on one of her retreats and sort of showed me how to teach a retreat and that type of thing. So I'm also immensely grateful for her and the years that we spent together because I really feel like she informed my core values in teaching. The other trainings that I have are Matt Pilates, Bar, and I also did the NASM Personal Trainer Certification. So those are all of the ones that I've done in the past couple of years. And then I am also going to do my 300 hour with Awakening Yoga Academy, which is Patrick Beach and Carling Harp's yoga school. Um, they have just online modules, which I feel like works good for me. And I've done trainings in the past and immersions and that type of thing in person. So I've gotten that and I'm just starting to do module by module. And I waited a really long time to do my 300 hour. I thought about doing it at the place that I did my 200, but I just wanted a different experience. 
and different perspectives, basically. And so it took me a really long time to land on the person that I want to do the next training with, but I definitely think they are the ones that I want to do it with. The next question is, have you had another job before YouTube and how is your journey to start being a content creator? Yes, I've always had other side jobs because I'm sure, as you know, if you're an instructor, you don't make a living if you're only teaching in studio, especially in other people's studios. You get very low wages and you literally can't live off of it. So I have always done other things, like I bartended when I lived in Hawaii because that was the way that I could make the most money and pay for my super expensive rent while I was there. I have also done sort of like farm work. I did that in Hawaii when I first moved there. I was in the California weed industry in like 2013 to 2016 or something like that. So yes, I've always done other things, but I've never had a nine to five career type of job. Yoga has always been my main passion and then I just did other things to supplement as I needed to. And my journey to being a content creator, I literally just decided to start posting. And it's funny because I actually started posting my classes in 2019 before the pandemic started and it was Noah's idea, honestly. He was like, I have the equipment, I'll literally show you how to film, you should just post your classes online. And so I started and I was very inconsistent at first because I was getting no views. It's really hard when you're starting to keep going because you don't get the validation of people watching the video. Um, but I feel like I just got in at the right time because when the pandemic started, I was like, all right, I'm just gonna post more classes. I'm not teaching in studio anymore. And it sort of just grew from there. If you are thinking about becoming a content creator or specifically a yoga content creator on YouTube, I would say the important thing is to find your niche and what makes you special because now so many people did it. And when I first started, there were almost no yoga sculpt classes on YouTube at all. And so I think that that was honestly what made me become popular in the beginning and then it just grew from there. So having that one special thing that you do and you're really good at will help you to grow and find your people even more. The next question is also about posting on YouTube. So any tips for starting to post yoga classes on YouTube without professional camera or lighting? I teach through Zoom and want to get consistent on YouTube but not sure how often I need to post. So I've always posted once a week, and some people definitely post more. I probably would grow more if I did post more, but because I have an app, I prioritize that because YouTube, you really don't make any money. Even now, you know, that I have a significant amount of subscribers, I still barely make money, and I don't look at YouTube as a source of income as much as I look at it as a way to market my classes. And I also love the service of being able to give classes for free for those who don't have the means to subscribe to the app or that type of thing. So it's a win-win, even though I'm not getting paid because I am helping to serve and that fulfills my heart. And it's also the best marketing for my app that I could ask for. So to answer your question, Tips for starting to post without professional camera or lighting. This is hard because so many people do have a professional camera. I would honestly say just invest, like save up, invest in a camera because if you're posting classes that you film on your phone, they're not gonna be the quality that people are used to. And then that's gonna affect the number of people who watch your classes. So I would say save up. There are some cameras that aren't that expensive and it will be worth it if you want to make this your long-term career, if this is your long-term goal. If it's not, then maybe it's not worth it for you, but I'd say that you can always sell the camera afterwards if you decide you don't like it. So 
definitely investing in something that's going to make your classes look good is important because people will keep coming back. And audio is also a really big thing. If you don't have a good mic, then the class is gonna sound bad and people are gonna click off of the video. So I do think it's super important and that you should invest in something. I have all of the gear that I use in my Amazon storefront, but if you guys are interested, I'm more than happy to make a video showing all the equipment that I use and giving some options for maybe a lower budget setup that you could buy. The next question is, I love your artistic style flows. Where does your inspiration come from? Honestly, it comes from everywhere. Sometimes I'll just get a random thought that pops into my head and will give me an idea for classes. It honestly happens a lot while I'm driving. So I have a million notes on my phone of little sequence ideas or flows and that type of thing. Um, another place that it comes from is taking other classes, especially in studio classes, where you can really just get into your body, you're not thinking so much, and I find the inspiration comes that way, and it's not in the way that I do someone else's sequence, and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna do this exact same sequence. It's more that inspires me, it gives me those little pings of ideas, when I'm simply moving my body. Another big source of inspiration is doing other types of movement. So I think doing other trainings, getting other qualifications like Pilates, bar, strength, that type of thing, that informs your teaching so, so much. And also just moving around on the mat, just having your own personal practice and being open to sort of get outside of the lines and not care so much about the traditional poses will really unlock your practice and your creativity. The next question is, how long did it take for you to find your voice when teaching on YouTube? Honestly, I was talking about this with one of my friends the other day. I think that it definitely takes time. It's similar to when you first start teaching, you know, when you do your 200 hour, you don't feel ready to teach an in-studio class at all. It takes time, it takes practice, you have to find how you like to teach, what you're comfortable teaching, that sort of thing. I honestly didn't even post the first couple of classes that I filmed because it was just bad. I felt so inauthentic, I felt like I was trying too hard and that type of thing. I think that it took me probably six months to really get comfortable and once I solidified my brand and my values and what I was doing, what I wanted to put out in the YouTube space, the virtual world, that's when I started to get really comfortable and it honestly, you just keep getting more comfortable. So just like anything else, consistency, practice, and knowing that it's okay to mess up and that it is just a learning experience. The next question is also about teaching. I have graduated from my yoga teacher training for four years, always wanted to share my practice, but I find myself having the challenge of planning yoga classes each week. How do you get inspiration ideas to plan a class weekly? So this will be a similar answer to where I get my inspiration from, but I'd say, Number one, moving yourself, taking other people's classes, having your own practice, doing workouts, that type of thing, being in that space of moving your body. And then from there, I would plan either a peak pose, a feeling on how you want your students to feel during and after class, um, certain poses that you want to incorporate or a part of the body. So you can focus on heart opening, you can focus on twisting, you can focus on forward folds, that type of thing. Um, you know, having a peak pose like headstand and then doing a flow that will help students get comfortable getting upside down or same thing with crow. So I think having an idea what you want your classes to focus on is super helpful for this because if you're just teaching you know well-rounded vinyasa flows over and over and over again it's really hard to get that inspiration so having some sort of focus 
even if it's just a feeling and you want your students to walk off the mat feeling lighter or you want to help them cultivate self-love or something along those lines, that can be super helpful in giving you inspiration. I think there's a tendency to want every flow to be perfect also, especially if you're teaching classes in studio and you have you know the same people coming to class every single week and you you know want to make the flow different and exciting for them but a lot of times people are not going to remember the flows that you did before and people don't care if it's a hundred percent perfect they aren't going to know a difference because they're not a teacher themselves so i think stepping back and taking the pressure off of you to teach an absolutely perfect class every single time will then allow you to teach better classes because you won't be so stressed about it, if that makes sense. And I also always, always keep the flows that I've taught before. So I have a Google Doc of flows that I've taught. And so if I'm really needing some inspiration, I just go back through that and I'll mix and match parts of sequences from different classes and then create a new one of sequences that I've already taught and I know that landed and worked in people's bodies. The final question is, is it sustainable to be a yoga teacher? Do you consider changing your career? or do you have another occupation right now? I touched on this a little bit. I don't think it's sustainable to be a full-time yoga teacher teaching at other people's studios. I know that some people do it and they love it and they teach you know, 10 to 20 classes a week. Personally, for me, that life was way too stressful way too much of my energy. I'm a pretty introverted person in general, so being around that many people all the time and holding space for them was a lot emotionally and mentally for me. So I didn't find that to be sustainable in my body and it probably isn't sustainable long-term unless it's the right person doing it. So I honestly, which is sad to say, don't think only teaching yoga is sustainable. And when I was teaching in studio, I was always supplementing my income with other things. Currently, with my business online, my app, I am able to only do this. And even though I am able to make a living right now, it always ebbs and flows. And I feel like that's the nature of having a business and doing freelance type of thing. But I also think it's a beautiful thing if you are super passionate about yoga and you also have another career, doing both of them is amazing. The studio that I go to in person, every single teacher that teaches there has another career that actually makes them money and then they just teach for fun sometimes. And I honestly envy that in a way because they are able to be detached from the classes that they're teaching and they just go to the studio, they show up, they teach a class, and then they don't have to think about the money or the business or the brand afterwards or during the class. And so I think that in that way, it's sustainable to be a yoga teacher. If you have another career that can supplement your cost of living and you don't need to only be a yoga teacher we are multifaceted as humans and we can do many things and that being said to answer the last part of the question i do work with my boyfriend sometimes he is a filmmaker and he does freelance stuff so i also help him film a lot of times on shoots and we actually just rebranded our wedding business which i've never really talked about before. We also film weddings and that's a way that we are able to supplement our income together. We can travel and we honestly love shooting weddings. It is always so fun. So if you are in the market for a wedding filmmaker, we do film and then we also have some photographers with our brand that we bring along sometimes if you want to do like the whole package. And so yeah, we rebranded into doing more adventure, outdoor, that type of elopement wedding, but we do also do traditional weddings. So if you're interested, I will also put a link down below in the description, but I love having that as a way to supplement our income, yes, but it's something fun 
for us to do that enhances someone's experience during their wedding day and feels fulfilling and it's not attached to yoga. So it's nice to have those different things that you're working on and that are fulfilling, gratifying in a different way. And that is it. Thank you so much for writing any questions. I had so much fun sitting down to chat with you all and I hope I answered your questions as well as I could and look out for more vlogs soon. I definitely want to keep it rolling with this type of content. You can always let me know what you would like to see more of down in the comments, both vlog style content and classes, that type of thing. If you would like to sign up for the app, I would absolutely love that. We actually have a series that just dropped. It is called Glow on the Go. It is a travel series. So workouts that are full body under 30 minutes with minimal equipment and it's honestly one of my favorites i've ever filmed because i filmed it at the retreat center in baja and it's just a stunning location i put music in the video so they're really easy to just put on do the workout quickly and you're set for the rest of the day so if you would like to join us i'll put a link down below as well and thank you so so much for being here i appreciate you all so 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 much and I will see you in my next video. Bye.